So let's just wait a couple of minutes just for people to uh, log in. Okay, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good evening, everybody. So just for us to stay on time and uh, have this webinar go as smooth as possible, we're going to start right away. So uh, first of all, I'd just like to thank uh, all the attendees uh, for coming out tonight and uh, supporting uh, the webinars and supporting, of course, the society and supporting uh, uh, the different companies. Uh, I'd like to, of course, thank uh, Prime Partners for their uh, initiation of these uh, webinars, as well as BD for their support. Uh, today's webinar is going to be focusing on uh, DVT, and next week we have another webinar that's going to be focusing on uh, arterial disease, which is going to be uh, on the 14th. Um, we're very lucky today to have uh, two uh, very well-known uh, international European speakers regarding uh, venous disease and uh, DVT, and we have uh, two of our uh, local panelists. I'd like to introduce them briefly before before we start. Um, our uh, webinar today is going to have two lectures. Each lecture is approximately 15 minutes. After each lecture, we're going to do uh, about 10 to 15 or 20 minute discussion, first between the panelists. And then the second part is going to be uh, open questions from the attendees. So the open questions, if you don't mind, you're going to write them directly in the Q&A, please. Do not write them in the chat. Um, if they're in the chat, we might not notice it directly. So please uh, write it in the Q&A if you don't mind. So first of all, I'm going to introduce the panelists. So we have Dr. Mohamed Badran. So everybody that uh, knows interventionists in the region, uh, I'm pretty sure they know Dr. Mohamed Badran. He's a consultant interventional radiologist in King Faisal Specialist Hospital in Riyadh. He is the head of the vascular normally program and probably one of the uh, most experienced person or physicians in treating vascular anomalies in the region. Uh, he's a UK graduate uh, and has been was working there for many years before he came to Saudi Arabia and been with us for the last 11 years. Uh, he does a lot of venous work as well, and he has also a lot of interest in uh, lymphatic disease. Our second moderator or uh, panelist is Dr. Abdelaziz Al-Gharras. Uh, I know Abdelaziz Al-Gharras uh, personally from before he started his training, um, very aspiring uh, radiologist, very um, a smart medical student. And now he's been working here in Saudi Arabia for the last couple of years. Um, he works in Ghassim and with uh, Ghassim University. He is Canadian trained in residency at McGill University and he did his interventional radiology fellowship at Cleveland Clinic in the United States. Our two uh, speakers are Dr. Michael Lichtenberg. He is the, from Arnsberg in Germany. He's the chief medical officer in angiology clinic. Uh, and he's the head of the vascular scientific department there and the president of the German angiology group. He has, if you, if you ever go to Circe or Link or anything like that, I'm sure you've seen him speak. I'm sure you've seen many of his publications as well. He's a very nice and very great speaker. So I really encourage everybody to uh, stay out for this whole hour. Our second speaker is Dr. Rick de Graaf. He's an interventional radiologist also from Germany. 
He works in Germany. He graduated from Maastricht in the Netherlands in 2010 and started working in deep venous obstruction and thrombosis uh, for a while. And he's had a lot of collaboration with uh, uh, and geology clinics in Arnsberg as well. More than 60 uh, publications in uh, vascular interventional disease. And he currently works as the director of interventional radiology and nuclear medicine uh, in uh, the center of, I'm sorry, Rick, if I don't pronounce this correctly, but the center of Richterschaffen uh, in Germany. Okay, I'm sorry about that if I didn't pronounce it correctly. So uh, to stay on time, uh, we're going to start uh, with uh, Michael. Uh, the floor is yours for the next 15 minutes, and then uh, we're going to start our discussion uh, right after that. Thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much also for the invitation and the possibility that we can discuss uh, tonight about acute DVT. I think it's a very important topic and uh, hopefully we can discuss um, yeah, the issues and the still open questions. So first of all, please confirm you can see my slides. Is that correct? Uh, yes, it's clear. Thank you. Yes, we do. So my topic um, is mechanical thrombectomy for aerofilmal deep vein thrombosis. Um, I would like to give you my perspective. Um, I call it safe and effective. And um, yeah, let's discuss about that. But before we start with that, I would like to uh, pull up two polls um, just to see where we stand at the moment in the different opinion on DVT treatment. So can we have the first poll, please? So the first poll would be my current opinion slash practice for acute illofilmal DVT is A, every acute illofilmal DVT needs thrombectomy to prevent PTS or I only treat phlegmasia or I'm selective for acute DVT treatment or except phlegmasia, every illofilmal DVT should only be treated with anticoagulation. So what is your opinion? Please share with, you, with us your opinion, your approach so that we can uh, discuss also later on the different opinions and way of uh, treatment. Once we have the um, answers, we can show the analysis. So most predominant answer is I'm selective for acute DVT treatment. Okay, perfect. Second poll. My preferred therapy for idiofilmal DVT is A, CDT therapy, B, manual aspiration, C, pharmacomechanical thrombectomy like angiojet, for example, or JEDI. Uh, D, pure mechanical thrombectomy like clot retriever, Asperex, Penumbra, or whatever you have on shelf for pure mechanical thrombectomy or open surgery. Please vote. Give, me, give us your, your opinion, please. This is not the answer. Um, I think there was an issue with the first time. Can people answer again, please? Ah, so predominantly pharmacomechanical or pure mechanical, no open surgery and 21% CDT. Okay. Thank you for that. That's the first impression on the different therapy approaches. So I will focus on pure mechanical thrombectomy. So um, of course, I uh, would like to share my disclosures with you as you could see here. So what are the, uh, the backgrounds? The background, especially for PTS, I think they are clear. This is evident. It's a very frequent complication, but definitely still underestimated as a chronic complication after idiofermal DVT. More than 25% of the patients post uh, idiofermal DVT develop uh, uh, PTS. 
Um, when we just focus on attract, it's even 28%. And up to 10% of these patients will even develop a severe post-thrombotic syndrome. So when we have a look at the um, subgroup analysis of the ATTRACT uh, trial, I'm not focusing on the main uh, study, I'm focusing on the subgroup analysis where they just focus on the acute ill thermal DVT group. The, um, the clinical implication from that analysis, which was published by Komarota, is uh, I think clear. These findings support the early use of pharmacomechanical CDT therapy. So a clear, um, you know, hint that um, um, thrombus removal prevents DVT. And when we look at the patient outcome within this Komarota trial published in 2019, you can clearly see in terms of efficacy that the prevention of a PTS uh, and also of course severe PTS was significant in, in terms for the um, uh, therapy approach, especially if we compare it um, with other trials, you see here the Vialta score, the VCSS score, the VEIN score after 24 months after treatment, highly significant improvement over a conservative approach. And also safety reporting, very interesting. No bleeding complication for the CDT arm or pharmacomechanical arm. No significant difference between the um, conservative arm and the PCDDT arm. What you can definitely see when you look at the lower part of that uh, slide here, bleeding complication from other already published trials like the PER registry, this is the Enderjet trial, the Venus registry, the carbon trial, so the CDT trial, you can see that complication with CDT was significantly higher um, in, um, in comparison to ATTRACT. So that means we are getting better with CDT therapy, less bleeding complication than in the former times. We recently published a meta-analysis comparing CDT therapy versus mechanical thrombectomy. We performed this meta-analysis uh, together with international experts from the United States, also Rick joined and colleagues from um, Poland. And what we did is we analyzed uh, backwards from the uh, 47, 46, uh, so long time ago, publications on CDT therapy and mechanical thrombectomy. And we wanted to see, uh, find out if there's a significant difference in terms of uh, efficacy and safety between these two uh, treatment arms. So the methods in the studies which we analyzed were on one hand side, the thrombolysis group, we referred CDT therapy we, to this group, we referred ultrasound accelerated CDT like the ICROS uh, system to this uh, group, uh, CDT plus balloon maturation or even systemic thrombolysis. On the other hand, we analyzed uh, mechanical uh, uh, percutaneous mechanical thrombectomy devices like the Enderjet, um, uh, trial system and jet plus direct stand and just uh, plus CDT plus state stand um, to see if there are efficacy difference and safety difference between these two um, um, study arms. This is the flow of the study. I don't want to bore you with that. At the end, we had 20 articles and 19 studies included in this meta analysis. I will just focus on some endpoints regarding efficacy on one hand. Lysis grade two, three, meaning uh, more than 90% thrombectomy. On the above part of that slide, you see the CDT group in terms of that endpoint. Below, you see the percutaneous mechanical and um, uh, um, pharmacomechanical group. You see in terms of that endpoint, lysis grade, no difference. So both are very equivalent uh, with this endpoint, no significant difference. This also counts for the overall PTS rate, no significant difference for the PTS endpoint between CDT arm and PMT arm. And also for the endpoint moderate severe PTS, also including the, or especially including the Camarota trial, the attract subgroup analysis, no significant difference in terms of that efficacy endpoint. But in terms of bleeding complication, a highly significant difference between the PMT arm and the CDT arm. And based on this safety analysis, a clear advocate, I clearly advocate 
for PMT because the bleeding complication was the big issue in all thrombolysis study arms. Therefore, the conclusion we made from this meta-analysis, the real advantage for PMT is the safety aspect. It's a significant lower bleeding complication reported within any PMT trial. Um, in terms of efficacy, there was no difference, especially in terms of uh, PTS or reflux with PMT, even that there are some small um, difference, so small trends. But therefore, we clearly stated that PMT is the way to go in terms of safety. And I would like to introduce you now to the new devices and new techniques we have on the market. And one device I would like to show you, which recently was um, acquired by Somotix, is the Wetix catheter. Um, we had the honor and chance to evaluate this system uh, within our clinic together with uh, Steve Black and Gary O'Sullivan. This is a system which has a 19 cage at the tip, as you can see here. This cage opens proximal to the thrombus and then, pull, and then is pulled back. And during pullback, you activate an archimedic screw within this catheter. So whatever you remove from the vessel wall is then captured in the catheter using this archimedic principle. And I would like to show you uh, just one uh, case example where, uh, where we use this uh, Vitex um, um, catheter. This is a 20 year old female patient with a Maytherna associated descending iliofemoral DVT prone position. You see transportbetal approach on the left side. This is the baseline angio. So fully descending acute iliofemoral DVT, very fresh. Um, symptoms since 48 hours are not very long. You see on the third uh, video, um, we passed the, uh, the thrombotic occlusion here. This is the IVC contrast filling. You see already an extensive collateralization, but no deep vascular on the last slide here. On the next uh, analysis, I would like to show you how we removed in this patient um, the thrombus. Hopefully this uh, is now advancing, yeah, it goes. So you see here now the catheter with the open catch, the cage, and now it's pulled back. Archimedic screw is activated and then compressed within the Maytherna point. You see this compression of the cage. And then it opens again, declots the iliac vein system, and then the clot is removed into the um, Archimedic, with the Archimedic screw into collection bag. This is after pass two, as you could see here, you see already nice flow, of course, still residual thrombosis. And on the third slide, you see um, already very good flow. Um, no, um, yeah, stand, no sustain or no uh, problems with outflow, good inflow. So from a technical point of view, um, good clinical uh, situation by that point. Of course, stenting was then performed in this uh, patient. And here you see the final result at the end, uh, post-thrombectomy and adjective uh, therapy. Um, with stent implantation on the, uh, in the middle um, slide, and you, you see the outflow, no residual thrombosis at the end, and also very good inflow from the deep uh, venous system. No thrombolytics were used. The valvular function uh, was very good after the intervention. So the Vialta score immediately improved in this patient, and this patient could, uh, could be sent home after a short stay, after two days uh, in, in the hospital. So another device I would like to show you is the um, recently brought to Europe um, clot retriever device. It's very familiar already in the United States with all, already some very great data. This is a device which you could see here on the uh, right side with a collection bag and with a coring element. And this collection bag is um, used like a fissure net, which captures the thrombus and takes all the thrombus out. And this is the example of one of our last clot retriever thrombectomy approaches therapies uh, just a few days ago. And this is what we um, got out here in this subacute DBT. And here I would like to show you a video um, of, an, of a live demonstration of this system where we use this system. And uh, you see here this cage, which is pulled back through the Maytherna syndrome in this young patient, 
we pulled back the long collection back and then um, <clears throat> pulled all the traumas out, which is captured within this collection bag. Usually you only need two to three passages with this uh, device. It adapts to the vessel size, so you can use it uh, with the 13 French access sheet within uh, the Iliac um, system very easily. There's also a large system, 16 French uh, system available with that you can treat also IVC thrombosis. And this is the um, very special access sheet. And through this access sheet, you pull out this catheter as you can see here. And um, on the next slide, I would like just to show you how we clean then the collection bag here and um, yeah, uh, get all this capture thrombus out of this collection bag. Uh, we really melt this thrombus out of this catheter as you could see. Um, and this is how we do it. And after a thrombectomy, this is here after the second passage, we already see that the fresh thrombus is um, mostly removed from uh, the uh, iliac vein system. Some organized material is still present. We then um, advance the system another time and after three passages. And I show you this in the next slide. We implanted a stand proximally and we had a very good outcome at the end. Um, there was no persistent uh, thrombosis left in this iliac um, deep vein thrombosis. There's another system I would just briefly show you. This is the um, JEDI system. Uh, JEDI was recently, um, last week, bought by Abbott Vascular. This is a system which you can really compare a little bit with the ANGIO system. And this is a case where we use the JEDI system in a patient with a uh, acute DVT, iliofemoral DVT, descending DVT, very super fresh uh, DVT, but uh, also involving the uh, popliteal segment. This patient already had a stent in there, so it was a stent-associated DVT. And in these cases, we puncture the uh, anterior tip vein with an eight French axis. And here you see the helper pulse mode of this JEDI system. The, with that, we apply the thrombolytic drug as a first step, only 10 milligrams of TPA plus 5,000 units of heparin. And with that, we infiltrate this super fresh thrombus then we go for a two minute coffee, come back. And after this, we start with the active mode and um, yeah, start to um, um, declot the system with the, engine, with the uh, JEDA system. So you see here, this is a, um, a stand which was uh, yeah, implanted in this young lady 10 years ago somewhere. This is an old wall stand, uh, as you could uh, probably see. And now here after two minutes, three minutes waiting, we started with active aspiration. I just want to show you here how this system, yeah, very effectively grabs this super fresh thrombus here. Uh, once we started it right now, um, you see how this really takes all this fresh thrombus out. Um, even without wire, without wire, it is more effective than using uh, a wire, which then of course blocks the, um, yeah, the activation part of this, um, catheter the channel so with even without um or it's better to use it without a guide where with that um yeah you are even more efficient so this system is also a system a percutaneous mechanical thrombectomy system which you can nicely use for acute dvt instant in native uh, veins highly efficient by that time, of course, and this is, I think, the issue, we don't have any comparison data for all these new devices. From my perspective, um, mechanical thrombectomy and venous occlusions is very effective uh, for acute, subacute, and also acute on chronic venous thrombus, as also instant thrombosis. Um, it restores vein patency in uh, many indications, also including the upper limb, of course. It preserves valve function. The main advantage is that it has low risk um, problems, as I showed you on the meta-analysis, especially if you compare it to the, the thrombolytic uh, therapy. You don't need to send the patient to ICU usually because you end the case on the table within one hour, within one to, uh, two hours. So it's a one-step procedure ended in the angel uh, lab, I think is the term I would use here. And of course, with this very efficient uh, approach, we prevent uh, yeah, the risk of post-traumatic syndrome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Very, very nice presentation. Love the devices, love the videos. Uh, 
Unfortunately, none of these are still available here. Uh, we've been waiting for Cloud Retriever or Cloud Retriever for a while now. We still haven't gotten it yet in the Middle East. Uh, I've heard that it's going to come uh, very soon. So um, we're going to start right now with some uh, discussion between the panelists. So if, uh, I'll allow maybe Dr. Mohan Badran to start first to see if any comments or any questions. Uh, thank you very much. Very uh, spectacular and beautiful presentation. Um, I have three, maybe probably I put my my comments in a, in a question mode rather than a comment. Uh, the first one will be, you know, uh, the valves in the femoral veins. I know you mentioned that uh, th there will be no destruction of the valves, but don't you think uh, that's hard to believe with with a big mechanical device going down the wrong way around of the valve. Where would you think about the possibility of trying to uh, maybe clean the top end first and the iliac from bottom, and then go from the neck and clean the veins from the, uh, the way, other way, uh, other way, so that you can clean the veins without uh, destroying the valves in the thigh? Yeah, this is an interesting approach. Um, and I, I, I did not use this approach yet, but we can also uh, include Rick. I don't know if you use it. Um, I, I agree uh, for, for probably the cloud, uh, for, for the clot retriever system, where it could happen that the valve is damaged. But based on the recently shown cloud registry from clot retriever, they did not see any valve damage. So this is what they see in this large registry. Um, when we are talking about therapy like the Angiojet or Trellis or Jedi, I would say the valve risk is not that high. With, with the clot retriever, maybe, yeah, we need to grab more data, but let's involve Rick here also. Rick, are you going then for, for um, transjugular access in these cases? Yes, thank you. There's some technical issues to consider, of course. Um, when you use the clot fever, it's not possible to go from uh, from the jugular or from, from the cotilateral side because you, you need your 30 centimeters to, to deploy the, um, the baskets, let's say, to, to, um, to uh, gather all the thrombus. So you cannot go deep enough uh, into the um, uh, calf veins. That also counts probably also for the... Uh, for the other um, uh, retrieval system, um, but but uh, having said that, okay, for for example, for the for the uh, thrombosuction for the jet eye, that that might be an uh, interesting idea. However, uh, there you would suppose that it will not uh, lead to valve damage at all when you go from endograd uh, fashion. So, but thinking about valve uh, destruction, um, I don't see any. In my experience, at least, I don't see any anatomical, um, so let's say microscopic, microscopic um, uh, uh, proof uh, that or indication that valves are damaged. Uh, that doesn't, of course, say that you don't have it at a microscopic level. However, as we know that within 24 hours of a thrombosis, the valves are already damaged in a way. So uh, to really make this an, a value a valuable uh, discussion we need some some almost microscopic imaging uh, between you know uh, what, what's what trump is doing to valve um per se and what, what are the what are the systems doing doing to it what i see in this last thing that i'm going to say what i see is that usually the systems really um really remove clot very very well from the iliac and femoral veins however there's always some residual clot just below the, the, the valves, just around the valves. You cannot get that away. So that, that also gives me an indication that it's not that aggressive that it will also damage the valves. Very interesting, uh, I think, uh, that concept of clot retrieval. Uh, but I think maybe if we go backwards a little bit, I think one of our major obstacles is doing the pr procedure in the first place. Uh, because as you know, many of the, some of the physicians are enthusiastic about it, but um, a lot of the physicians are very optimistic and they bring you the data from the, the uh, you know, from the attract the trial itself, uh, from recommendations of Royal Colleges of, of Physicians. You probably, you are obviously doing a lot of this in your hospital. Perhaps you can share with us how your journey started from maybe doing nothing to a lot. 
Mm. Yeah, that's a good uh, good question, a very important uh, discussion point you, you, you bring up here. Of course, we are facing also a lot of, let me say, conservative discussions here, also in Germany, meaning um, why are not starting with anticoagulation, stocking and treat these patients on the later stage? So on the chronic, uh, if they if they really then, um, yeah, have a PTS uh, syndrome or persistent venous claudication. So the, the problem is at the moment, I think that we do not have not good data um, to identify the perfect patient. Um, we, we are not able to see into the future to say this patient is develop developing a PTS or not. Now, not every patient is developing PTS. So what is the rationale to treat patients with acute DVT if not every patient develops a PTS? This is, I think, the, <clears throat> the, the, the biggest issue and the biggest issue within the discussions. But I personally believe if we only um, use mechanical thrombectomy with a very low uh, safety issue, or, um, with a very high efficacy, I think um, this outweighs the argument if this patient wouldn't um, develop a PTS, so why do you treat it? If you use a safe, simple, fast technique without um, harming the patient, I think um, is a good indication to treat most of descending aortic DVT. I would never ever treat uh, a FAMPOP ascending DVT. So I always treat descending aortic DVT, so methana associated DVT. So selective, selection is important. This is, I think, important. Fresh thrombos, young patient, active patient, uh, this patient will probably develop uh, venous claudication or persistent swelling pain. These patients are the typical candidates from my side to treat these patients. And therefore, in these patients, I'm very aggressive because it's a safe technique with mechanical thrombectomy. It's efficient and I'm not harming these patients with that. Hey, perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll allow uh, Dr. Abdel Aziz to see if you have any comments or questions. Yeah. Uh... I mean, a comment about like using a jugular axis, um, you might start to break the clot and then you start charring the clots all the way up to the lines. And that's something that we have to be very careful about it. So like using some catching uh, technique that can help us to treat that. And as you mentioned, like, you know, which population of patients still, we do not, we don't know which patient that we need to treat with uh, these uh, kind of, cases, so LUK, LU, LU femoral or iliac, when you have iliac DVT, that's maybe for me as an indication that I have to treat it with mechanical. Yeah, I agree. Okay, uh, excellent. Uh, uh, Rick, do you have any questions for Michael or comments? Um, yeah, one, one, one question. Um, so the last case, Michael, it was a very fresh uh, trauma, you said, and still, you know, with the Jedi and still you, you uh, infused uh, thrombolytics. Um, do you think that that has a, as an advantage in except uh, in dead thrombus, or or is there a certain time frame that you would wa want to use it? What do you think? So this was a patient within a Jedi study. So the protocol gives us, uh, yeah, the protocol says we have to infuse some uh, some yeah TPA. I'm not convinced that we need it because it's a very powerful um, suction treatment. I don't think so. We do, yeah, maybe in very organized material, we, we, we could fresh up something, yeah. But I fully agree. Um, I think the pure mechanical uh, aspect of the Jedi uh, system is so efficient. I probably don't think we need it. No, great, thank you. Uh, perhaps if oh, I can perfect. just bring, uh, do you have time to just go? Or... Because we have a few questions from the, from the okay. audience. Right. Maybe if we finish that and we have time, we'll uh, allow for some more comments. So we have three questions from the audience. One question, uh, I'm sure, Michael, you all get it a lot, and I'm sure Rick probably gets it a lot, is a very common question. Every conference or every webinar related to thrombectomy, I hear this question. And it's related to the use or not use of IVC filters. And if you use it, how long do you keep it in? Do you just put it during the procedure and remove it, or do you remove it later, or do you not use it at all? So a very simple answer, we do not have any IVC filter here on shelf. Agree? I, I totally <laughs> agree, I totally agree. What about the patients that, for example, already have a massive PE and they have very bad cardiopulmonary status? This is the patients that sometimes we think of using it or using a CaptureX, for example, device 
that yeah. protects. What do you think about that? Yeah, th these are uh, yeah, very selective cases. I f fully agree. A Capturex, so a non-permanent filter system, which we just use to, to protect the thrombus um, yeah, streaming up. This is a, uh, an approach which we use sometimes indeed. Yeah. Um, in patients with severe pulmonary embolism, um, I would ask um, probably not to treat the iliopharmal DVT. I just, I would go up to the pulmonaries and clean the pulmonaries and leave the DVT like it is. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, yeah sounds good. Don't risk the patient more with uh, accidentally, um, you know, upstream thrombus uh, removal. Uh, Actually. Yeah. Okay, uh, excellent, nice. I, I like that approach a lot. Uh, the second question is, the, is there any difference or any role of doing anti-grade versus retrograde approaches in treating DVTs? So I'm not very uh, familiar with the transjugular approach in acute DVT treatments. I don't know. Rick, are you doing transjugular approaches for the acute DVTs? No, not so much. Uh, I, I don't, don't like the excess. I, I would like to prevent uh, general anesthesia. Therefore, I would go from the contralateral side and I'm just going to, I'm going to uh, mention it shortly in, in my presentation. Okay, okay excellent. Um, the last question I guess we'll take from the audience is a two part question. So one is, so based on your presentation or your first question about the patients that you select, so who are your, uh, what is your selection criteria of what patients you treat? You are, I think you briefly touched upon it, but if you can give it to us like more uh, 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 clear. And the second part of this question is when you choose a patient to treat, what is the established time to treat? Like within how long would you treat the patient? A week, two weeks, one month? There's a lot of arguments behind that. And sometimes it's hard to decide if there's acute on chronic DVT, you know, these kinds of issues. Yeah, maybe starting with that point, I probably think that we never see a super fresh DVT. It's always fresh on something going on for days. Yeah, um, So uh, I don't think that we see really in our practice really fresh thrombus um, DVT. Um, so therefore, um, I think the average is somewhere between two, three, uh, maybe sometimes four weeks. With the clot retrieval device, we have the chance to re even escalate this to maybe one, two months. Yeah, that's possible with this device. Um, so I'm very selective, as I mentioned, for, for the treatment indication. So young patient, very active, high risk for PTS. So this is the active young patient who may develop um, um, venous claudication, persistent swelling uh, complaints. These are treat and which have a clear uh, NPS associated descending early activity. This is the perfect patient and this patient you can treat immediately very effective and safe. And after one, two days, you can send this patient, young patients home. No, they usually don't have any comorbidities. So you don't expect any complications in these patients. Uh, okay, I guess uh, that sounds uh, very good. I have just one comment or one question actually, which is something, well, me and Bedran work in the same hospital. So we've been facing this for a while now is what's the secret of recruiting patients? We find it very difficult and very hard to get patients. And most of the referrals that we finally get are usually the complex cancer patients that have like more chronic DVT that don't have a like have a short life expectancy, very complicated patients. We rarely get the like the Mayfern or the acute DVTs. How do you, what's your secret of getting patients? Is it just physicians agreeing or you recruit them directly or how? There, there is no, you know, Coca-Cola story <laughs> behind that. I don't know. Yeah, this is something. We started with that already 10 years ago. Uh, and Rick, he was very helpful and supportive. He, you may know, he worked in our institution also for two years. And he uh, and myself, we both developed this program here over years. So I'm very thankful, especially to Rick. And he's now the, his, his own chief medical officer in his clinic. Um, yeah, it's, it's a growing thing. Yeah. Um, and uh, so we, we get our patients from everywhere within Europe now, and we are around 300, 350 um, deep venous interventions per year. Um, there is no typical way or there is no typical um, yeah, aspect which I can mention here. It, it takes time. You always uh, need to think that awareness is a problem and you have to arise the awareness. So you need to do inf um, a lot of information, uh, inf uh, campaigns for the patients, awareness campaigns. This is definitely helpful. Um, 
Mm. Okay. But can I add to that? I mean, because uh, first of all, he gives me way too much credit. Um, but second of all, uh, that that's the, the whole thing is is uh, is time. Uh, I worked in, in Maastricht and we've seen um, some by, by friends, you know, friends throughout the country, they will send it to you. But the main thing is you start somewhere and uh, you do a great job like Michael uh, did and does every day. And uh, you know, you, got, you get you get the, the, the physicians enthusiastic and they, they see what they do, uh, what, what, what he does to the, for the patients. And then, you know, it snowballs and then you get more and more and more. You, you cannot start with, with 100 patients out of nothing. You know, you start with one and you do it well. And you, you start and, and they go to 10 and 100 and like Michael's now doing the, the, the most in, in Germany. So that's that's the way for us. Really uh, continue, you know, from, from one to, to, to a thousand. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, perfect. I think, Dr. Badra, we're going to go on for the next presentation. Well, well probably we can let your comments and we have more time in the end. Uh, so, uh, Rick, the floor is yours right now. Thank you very much for joining us. Yes, and thank you very much for the invitation, and, and thanks, Michael, for the uh, great presentation uh, just now because it really uh, I can really add uh, to that uh, from from here on. Uh, everybody can see the slides. Um, I hope so. Yeah. No disclosures. Um, so let's start with the. Uh, so it's all about diagnosis, diagnosis, and also treating the underlying cause of the of the thrombosis. And that's uh, what Michael already said. Of course, you know the, he mentioned that you, that you understand the underlying. Um, underlying cause, but you first need to diagnose. And what I think is when you just go in from with no uh, adequate imaging uh, before, and then, then you might miss some opportunities and you might miss the underlying uh, cause. Uh, and, and therefore you might, uh, might have a recurrence or something like that. And, and I think uh, already a little bit outside of this presentation, I think that that's one of the reasons why the uh, attracts and um, and also the CAFE trial when that that positive or were not positive uh, as you um, as they could have been. So anyway, so in imaging, of course, we have the duplex uh, ultrasound as you can see here, uh, very familiar. Uh, you can find DVT. The problem uh, is that most that do duplex do not really look for everything that's uh, that's 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 there to see you know sometimes like like actually um in the hospital that I, in maastricht that i went to in my early days as a radiologist you know i said okay just look in the in the in the uh, knee uh, in the knee uh, area and, and look in the in the uh, in the groin and uh, if there's compressible then it's okay well, then you miss out of quite a lot and um, you know you, the iliacs uh, you need to really Im, uh, image thoroughly to to find it and some patients are not very fit for for ultrasound so ultrasound is yes um, very available and uh, and accurate for for femoral and popliteal DVT however maybe not so much for iliac so we need something else so in most um, most hospitals, there's a CT uh, venography. Um, you can see here, uh, of course, and there's a floating thrombus or uh, a thrombus in the um, inferior vena cava. The, the point that I would like to make is, yes, you can see a DVT on, on, uh, on a CT venography. That's not, not a big image, maybe even without contrast, contrast because what does a acute DVT do? It dilates the vein. So if the vein on the left side is large, on the right side is normal, then uh, it's very likely to have a DVT. And where it's smaller, there there's no no DVT. So you can you can you know imagine that there is there's something going on. The problem is that you cannot see an acute and chronic. You do not know if a small vein is small because there's no thrombus inside, or there's thrombus inside, but, there's, but it's not dilating because it's um, fibrotic from an earlier thrombosis, stuff like that. It's all stuff that you cannot see on a CT venography. And there are people that want to try and convince me and say, yeah, if you do a direct CTV, you're going to see that and stuff like that. Um, I absolutely do not agree uh, with that, and I have never seen any um, picture that that uh, that can convince me that it's as good as an MR uh, venography. Because MR shows you not only the thrombus; it shows you the extent of the thrombus, of course, like like CT might also do. Um, but it shows you um, especially those um, post-thrombotic. Uh, 
you know, traffic relations maybe, uh, the acute and chronics, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it's a little bit more sensitive for an underlying compression. So adequate um, imaging will uh, help you a lot also during the thrombectomy um, procedure. So what we just talked about a little bit, where are you going to have your access? Well, most will have probably access uh, in, a, in a patient that's lying uh, prone uh, on the ipsilateral popliteal vein, and um, that's the most um, common approach. But you don't need to, to do that because if, always, because if you only have an iliac DVT, then you might go through the femoral vein. And um, that's an easier uh, route. And also for patients that do not like to lie prone for a long time, uh, that's, a, that's a valuable alternative. You have the contralateral common femoral vein. And I think that's a, uh, as, as I said, you know, I'm going to mention that in a, in a few moments. This is an excellent um, possibility. Uh, contralateral common femoral vein or jugular vein, if you want to treat also or only the, um, the profonda vein, because you can have either the femoral vein uh, occluded, you can have the uh, femoral vein occluded and the profonda, but sometimes you have the femoral vein from an earlier uh, thrombosis that's postsymptomatically occluded, and then you only have the profonda vein, like in this case, which is the predominant only outflow of the leg. So if you want to help the patient, you have to go through the um, through the um, profunda vein. And in some cases, there's a connection to the popliteal vein or sometimes even a superficial vein, and you can reach it, but in many cases also not. So you have to come from the jugular, uh, jugular or from the contralateral side. So how do you know that if you do not have uh, ad adequate uh, imaging beforehand? So then you probably maybe go through the popliteal vein and uh, end in, in, in some kind of disaster, disaster because you only have chronic um, obstruction um, to, to, to pass. So very important to diagnose it and to take the, the, um, the uh, important um, access route and, and approach. So this is the capture device. Uh, very sorry, this Uh, Rick, you're breaking up. We can't hear you. Hard, is everything okay? Well, I'm not sure. I think he has a problem in the internet connection, Dr. Shukran. Okay. Yeah. Um, So he logged out. Let's wait. He's going to log back in. Uh, yes, he get disconnected, doctor. Okay. Maybe in the meantime, uh, Badran, if you have, you can want to say your comment that you want to say before. Um, okay. Perhaps we can uh, talk about a potential concept of uh, trying to to sort out which patient to do and which patient not to do. And I was maybe bringing the, um, the clinical aspect of patient presentation and uh, thinking, okay, perhaps maybe the patient is doing bad. Uh, we give him anti-oral anticoagulation, he's improving. Perhaps that is a sort of patient you probably weren't gonna leave. But some patients, despite anticoagulation, they are still in poor condition after one or two weeks. Perhaps maybe those will be our patients to uh, do some treatment on them and do uh, whatever thrombectomy would like to do. Is that something you are doing in your hospital? Yeah, I fully agree. These are especially patients with very bad inflow, um, you know, profundo occluded, femoral occluded, popliteal also, you know, calf occluded veins. Yeah, and these are patients where I think, okay, I'm 
probably not that efficient with tombectomy. Yeah? These patients, I we then treat first conservatively. But if I see during the, the, the time that these patients are not improving, of course we are treating them. But then we are hopefully more on the chronic side and just could end it with um, stand implantation. But there's a high risk that these patients also need uh, also surgery approach, you know, like AB fistula or endoflabectomy. So these are the patients where we definitely need to be very critical and to identify from the beginning on, could it be a high risk patient where we don't establish good inflow outflow um, because of severe thrombosis um, or it's an easy case. So this is definitely important at the beginning. Can the patient be treated safely and efficient? I see Rick is, is back. Yeah? Yes, um, yeah. just for that, I think that, uh, you know, normally I don't have the problem, but I'm in a hotel because of an, uh, a conference and, uh, and stuff like that happens, uh, sadly. Uh, apologize. So what's the last word that, uh, that you heard? Well, well you can, I think the, the last, the, 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 the slide, uh, if you can put up your slide back, I can, I can let you know. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Um, So you see the slides, right? Yeah, so I think from the beginning of the slide, you started breaking up. So the next slide, when you went from here. So did you from see here, it? When the capture X, from here. From here is when you started breaking up. Okay, here, so, okay, so great. Um, so I just continue uh, on that. So, um, so MR venography, uh, except from, from or, um, you know, in, in contrast to CT, also can show you really the age of the thrombus, which is, very, very important um, to, to know what you're going to do. For example, here on the left side, you see the very fresh thrombus, right? This is uh, nicely dilated. You see a, a thin wall. There's not much of induration going on. And uh, this stuff you can probably easily get out with um, most devices. Um, this on the, on the right panel here, you see that's already, the wall is thickening. That's about seven days old, uh, probably. And that's already getting quite, that's quite difficult. On the IVC, you see, you see also see this, exactly this picture, that the wall is a little bit enhanced. And that's diff, more difficult with some devices to, uh, to get out. Uh, this already recanalized for 50%, more about three weeks, maybe a little bit older. And um, I think in my, experience only the clot free is, is really doing a good um, job still on that one not perfect but but uh, definitely better than the other ones and this is typically acute and chronic what i mentioned before right on ct you will see a normal vein diameter um, but it cannot enlarge because of the um, rigid walls but there's still thrombus inside you can also take this out so it's very important to have accurate imaging beforehand to know what you're going to do which device are you going to use uh, what are your options what are the access uh, possibilities so why um why do you need to know all this because there's there's one thing that you really want to do you take as much thrombus out as possible so and you need to know how much uh, can be removed, right? So in the fresh thrombus, you want to have that 100% thrombus, you want to uh, have, it, have it taken out. And if you have acute and chronic, you know that you're not going to take everything out. There's, there's probably going to be something left on trabeculations, etc. But remove as much as, um, as reasonable uh, possible. So why do you need to do that? There are two nice studies on that. The you know, in general, you can say the more thrombus you take out, the less likely, likely you're going to have uh, a, a PTS, and the more thrombus you're going to take out, the less likely you're going to have a recurrent DVT. Common sense. So, can I have the first polling question up, please? Let's do the do the two, but uh, first uh, the first one. Logically. Yes. So. After thrombectomy, how would you prefer to evaluate the results, right? So is that by angiography only, or do you need angiography and also intervascular ultrasound? Please submit. And if the results are in, please show me. Yes, absolutely. So 
we are we're looking at a, a, um, a larger um, percentage on, on endovascular ultrasound. And that has a reason, and I'll show you that reason. Because this you might see, right? You have nice, this is on IVUS, of course, uh, you have a nice, um, nice result um, after, after a couple of passages, uh, maybe. And you do an angiography, and you probably estimate, maybe, uh, you know, coming from AP view, that uh, maybe, I don't know, 80%, some, some might say 90% uh, is, um, is open. However, you know, that's, that's logic because you look from, from AP view and you don't see this on an angiography per se, right? You see everything that's, that's on the side. Um, so, um, but with IFIS, you can see that it's still 50% uh, uh, lumen. I hope I'm still, everybody can still hear me. Yeah, yeah you're going. Okay. Good. okay, yeah, I just, just see something changing. That's why I'm a little bit, <laughs> a little bit more um, afraid than, than normally. So um, anyway, so that's, that's, why, that's why IFIS is very important. Let's, let's go into the underlying uh, causes of the uh, DVT in the first place. So the most well-known, of course, is, is May-Turner compression. Uh, soon you can, you, you're not allowed to say that anymore, apparently, from the US uh, guys. So now it's a, a common iliac vein compression or some, some kind of compression syndrome, I don't know. So anyway, what we're talking about is some kind of outside compression on the vein. And this on MI, you can see again very nicely, this is a thrombosis with some dilatation and you can run it all the way centrally and then just behind the arteries here you can see a very tight narrowing and this is a true uh, compression that's been there for a long time it's fibrotic it doesn't dilate uh, there's some thrombus inside but the, but the most part is fibrosis so so you probably need to treat um, that so let's have the second poem question uh, up please then have that um to see what you think. So after maximal thrombus removal, only, in this case, only the external iliac vein still shows 30% of lumen reduction. Would you accept that result or place the stent to cover the residual thrombosis? Please have your answers. I think it's a bit tricky this question. Are you talking about acute or, or there's a the chronic element also in the external iliac or no? Mm, that's, that's, a, that's a good question, but I'm not going to answer that. I'm going to discuss it later. Okay, okay. Okay, so that's interesting and um, we can discuss it later, but Everybody's, everybody, the, the majority is, is, uh, is choosing a stent. And that's, that's something really to discuss, you know, what, what, is, what is adequate, what is reasonable? And either uh, it's, it's thrombus, apparently you didn't, couldn't take that out, or it's some kind of chronic uh, lesion, but 30%, 30% really, you know, if you started somewhere, do, do you always need to see, say, say B when you said a, a, if you understand what I mean? You know, sometimes a, a, you know the, 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 what, did, what did it say? The, the enemy of, uh, of, of, uh, of good is better, right? So anyway, we can discuss that later. But uh, that's something that, that I try to sometimes, you know, in an aggressive mode, I still want to be conservative. So let's move a little bit on to that uh, case of what I just um, showed on MR. There was a, um, a, a DVT, it took the, the thrombus out. This was a Maastricht where we still used ECOS um, and, and do thrombolysis. And after 24 hours, the, um, the femoral veins and the external iliac vein really cleaned out nicely, but it didn't progress. And back in the days, we didn't have IVIS there. And so, you know, you didn't do another 24 hours because you thought that it was, uh, it was still thrombosis in there and um, another 24 hours of thrombolysis. But in fact, we didn't need that because what we did later was do a balloon um, angioplasty and you can see the indentation, the wasting in the balloon, which indicates the chronic lesion at that uh, point. A May turner or a compression is not only just an, a compression, in many cases also a fibrotic lesion lying underneath. 
So we did the PTA and then did the angiography. And you can see it in angiography, it's a beautiful result, right? So uh, maybe in many cases you would, you would accept that, um, but we know from the literature and from experience that of course we should not accept that and we should place a stand, which we did here. And you can see here retrospectively, of course, there's still contrast hanging around and here it just moves away after stenting. So stenting is eminent if you wanna treat deletion um, optimally. So this is the case from, uh, I think Monday even, that I put in. Uh, this is typical acute and chronic. So I'm gonna play a little bit around here with the MR because it's very important to show it. So the um, inferior vena cava is uh, obviously um, open. And then this is the typical compression here behind the arteries. There the thrombosis start here, right? And this, I really want to note, um, notice that this is acute, right? But this is a little bit weird here. The wall is way bigger, you know, the distal common iliac vein, um, beginning of the external iliac vein, and the thrombus is not really that dilated. So the vein is not really dilated. So, so this is fresh. This is a little bit maybe acute and chronic or acute on, on the May Turner. And here again, so in the common iliac, a uh, common femoral vein, you can see also that this is not a normal venous configuration of an acute thrombosis. You know, there's a sharp lining, there's something going on there, or it, it, uh, there was something uh, that did uh, go on, you know, in the, in the, in the past. There is very fresh again. This is a little bit acute and chronic. And um, in the common femoral vein distally, where it's very important to have a perfect outflow, see what's going on here. This is also not very, very, very fresh. There's, there's this is a little bit fresh on, um, on chronic on trabeculations. So you really need to, to understand that and also understand your options because stenting here, the location is not a wise idea exactly on the confluence with a suboptimal inflow. So you see some other chronic um, indications. So uh, I did a thrombectomy. I stented the, um, the vein until the, uh, external, into the external iliac vein. The rest was completely clear. And we have a beautiful result with uh, a fast inflow and outflow. So, and I didn't treat the common um, femoral vein. I, you know, I, of course I treated it. I took out the thrombus that was there with the clot retrieval device, but, um, but I didn't stand it. And uh, still the, the inflow was, was really good. So in focus points, an adequate uh, pre-interventional um, cross-sectional imaging is absolute, absolute eminence. It's very, very important to show you the routes uh, that you can take. And, um, and how old the, the thrombus is uh, on MR. That's why I think MR venography is superior to CT venography. Uh, a per interventional evaluation during uh, um, the, the procedure, what is going on, how much thrombus am I going to, uh, am I taking out, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Where is still something left over? Um, very important. And IVE is the only tool that you can do that adequately with, in my opinion. And, um, at the end, optimal inflow and outflow is key, and therefore um, stand, you need to stand the significant uh, obstructions. Well, thank you very much for, for listening. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much. Images that you're showing are, are amazing. Uh, we do a little bit of MR venography, but I guess maybe not enough based on your presentation. We do mostly CT. Uh, and we, luckily we have Ivis uh, to help us a lot. So uh, let's open the floor, I guess, to start. Maybe we'll start with Abdelaziz first to see if there's any comments or any questions. Uh, I like uh, using MR. Like, I never used it, uh, but seeing your results, it's just uh, pushed me to use it in my practice. Uh, there is one comment kind of throughout these talks is, do you load your patient with heparin before you do your case? or you just start doing your procedure. And if you want to load your patient, how long do you load them? Like 12 hours, 24 hours, or 48 hours, and then do your procedure? Mm. No, in that case, yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. So, so first of all, I think it's, you know, you, 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 you diagnose a DVT. So in, on that moment, you, you really no, I, yeah. yeah, sorry. 
Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, so if you diagnose a DVT, I'm not going to intervene like directly on the table in the middle of the night, right? So, so what's going on? You're going to have conservative treatment anyway. So you're starting with, uh, you know, some some anticoagulation, maybe maybe heparin, maybe uh, some der derivate. Um, so it's already starting. So that's that's one thing. And I'm not going to stop any any anticoagulation before my venous intervention is not chronic, not acute. So I'm just going to leave it uh, leave it uh, running, or the patient's already on Xeralto or something like that. So um, second, when the procedure starts, I'm going to uh, you know I'm going to give five thousand units of heparin. Uh, and if my procedure uh, takes longer than two hours, I'm going to give another 5,000. So I'm very aggressive in that way. Uh, and, uh, you know, maybe that question also comes up after the procedure. Patient just continues on, on the on the all anticoagulation, DOACs on this in, in this uh, case. But what I also do is, okay, if you have a beautiful result, maybe I, I refrain. But most cases also give um, an aspirin, aspirin uh, milligrams. Uh, just to just to 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 make sure that um, that uh, well make sure to to limit the risks to a minimum of re recurrent thrombosis. Do you, do you check ACTs during the procedure or you don't? No. Yeah, just just okay. throw it in there. Okay, very nice, uh, Mohammed. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very beautiful presentation. Uh, and I, I just wanted to stress the importance of ascending versus descending uh, DVT, and that is very important, uh, you know, to attach to your talk because with descending uh, DVT, it's coming, something's happening at the top, and the MR venography is, is likely to show us why we are having this DVT starting from the top, going all the way down, uh, versus the ascending DVT starting in the calf and going up, and that's going to have uh, obviously poor prognosis. But my, my question here is, is um, uh, you know, the right-sided DVTs are interesting. They are really interesting. And it would be interesting to hear from your experience, uh, what causes are you most commonly find uh, causing descending DVTs? Mm -hmm. Well, well, descending DVTs, uh, uh, obviously, that's, that's uh, some kind of compression. I don't, I don't hardly see any any uh, malignancy. That's something that Jerry O'Sullivan and Nicole Way sees a lot. Um, but that whole ascending descending uh, DVT uh, thing, you know, Michael and I agree on almost everything. Um, but this 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 is something maybe that we do not completely agree uh, upon. Uh, yes, there's probably the, the DVTs that, that, that start from below and, and, and go up, and there are DVTs that start in the middle or whatever, uh, you know, after a superficial DV, uh, intervention, and, and some may start because of a, um, of a compression. I don't say that it starts directly there. However, um, for me, it doesn't really make a difference. The patient is going to come to you most of the time when it's complaints. So when does patients have complaints? Not when there's per se an occlusion of the common iliac vein, because the internal iliac vein is going to do um, the outflow. So uh, some some may, may feel something, but most patients I don't I think are asymptomatic. When do the uh, descending DVTs come to you? When it goes down in the groin bank, then you have complaints. The same counts for the ascending DVTs. They go up. They, they, you don't. You don't. Um, they don't. Uh, they don't have symptoms. You know, it comes in the common uh, femoral vein. The uh, the complete outflow is obstructed because the, the profunda is also involved. Bang! Then they come to you. So why wouldn't I treat those ascending DVTs? Of course, I'm also going to uh, uh, treat them. But you really have to be aware: is the profunda also involved? Um, if, if you have one outflow vessel available and the common femoral vein and the iliac veins are open, then the patient is going to do well. But um, that, for me, it doesn't, doesn't matter if it, where the DVT starts, it's where the DVT is right now. Do you not uh, worry about the calf DVT in terms of muscle function? Because, um, because of if the clot is still present in the calf veins and uh, there's not a lot of good flow in the calf to maintain the flow within the thigh and the iliac veins, then that poor flow perhaps is why there is concern about the ascending DVT. So uh, 
perhaps maybe the thinking should be if I'm going to do ascending DVT, I need also to focus on clearing the calf, de uh, calf veins as well. Absolutely, I totally agree with that. I'm, I'm extremely worried about it, but I don't have any tools to really go after the um, the calf veins. I mean, then you have to maybe some suction device with with a small lumen um, that you can, or small small friend size that you can go in different calf veins and you can open up like uh, like that um, in that way. But um, but I think that's a huge problem. But um, I don't say that the, I don't see that when the calf veins are are involved or the popliteal vein is involved, you cannot open it completely. Then still there can be enough uh, blood flow from the profunda uh, to to uh, to um, to treat the patient well. And I think that the profunda is many many times overlooked because the profunda is first of all not really imaged. Um, by cross-sectional imaging adequately and cannot be reached in many um, in many circumstances, and that's something that again MR venography is very very accurate. Then in many cases you can see a small connection between the femoral vein or the popliteal vein or even the superficial vein to the profunda, and you can reach that maybe even by a, a, a percutaneous puncture, puncture directly in profunda. But I do think that you need to go after the profunda vein if that's occluded, because it's a huge vein and the patient's really going to benefit if that's open. And thereby, you can also help the entire circulation and they, thereby maybe also the calf veins to recanalize on ant anticoagulation. Michael, am I talking nonsense or what do you think? No, 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 I fully agree. The only aspect is here long-term patency. Uh, um, could be an issue to to really bring this to a long term patency uh, to to just uh, what do you do dilating of this channel or what what you what you are doing to to uh, increase inflow. Oh yes, uh, sorry. No, it's it's just to get into the profunda and then by being able by the clot to to to. Ah. Um, to so you're talking about trans profunda thrombectomy. This is your approach, yeah. Yes, okay, okay. Well, and then and then go to the profunda. Yeah, right. And then and then take take trauma out of the profunda, because if uh, absolutely right, if you clean out the femoral vein without uh, taking care of the of the of the calf veins, of course the, the femoral vein is not going to have a, a a good patency. But you can at least treat the patient well and make sure that you do not have a further ascending DVT or a common femoral vein um, DVT left over. Uh, when the profunda is open, because then then it's going to wash out the um, the, uh, the, the the profunda, and therefore you know I'm I'm not I'm not that afraid of of afraid. I'm not so much against uh, treating the femoral vein uh, as much as you can in the profunda, also in ascending. But the, the the main issue, of course, is does the patient have complaints and is the common common femoral vein until the ng1 ligament completely occluded. That's my that's my indication, and it, yeah, for me it doesn't matter where the, where it started. Mm -hmm. You know, one point from the conservatives uh, in Germany is if you have an ascending DVT, so which just reach as you mentioned or described the calm femoral, and then the patient poof gets symptomatic. Um, the typical approach in uh, many clinics is, uh, you know, thrombectomy, and then you have residual thrombosis, and then you go for stenting. So you have the only standing situation in the calm femoral, and this is criticized now. Um, I can follow this argument a little bit, and, and this is the argument of, um, you know, why I'm a little bit conservative in ascending DBT. Now. Or we have so efficient devices that they can remove everything. Then it's, uh, I think, easy. Yeah. Absolutely, I agree with that. Hey, uh, excellent points. I, um, so, there are two comments from the audience and uh, I'll have one uh, comment maybe at the end. So one comment is reg regarding DVT uh, in pregnancy or like severe or significant or massive DVT in pregnancy. Is there any role for doing anything at these patients or do you wait or what do you do? No, we are not treating pregnant women. It's only if they have phlegmasia and we need to, uh, we are forced to. This is the indication. If they have um, um, an acute DVT, give them low molecular weight heparin. Um, and then after a couple of weeks, um, months uh, after that, you can see them on a chronic uh, indication maybe, but this is very individual, but don't treat uh, acute DVT unless you are forced to in a pregnant woman. This is my standpoint. Yeah. I agree. 
Okay, excellent. I guess uh, we're following the same in the same footsteps, so that's good. So the second point is uh, probably a little bit controversial, nothing very clear in terms of post-procedure uh, anticoagulation. Like recently in the UK, there's a few, few newer guidelines about uh, post-procedure anticoagulation and medications. So what's your practice in terms of that? And then the second point in terms of post-procedure care, in terms of patient instructions, let's say wearing stockings, exercise, these kind of things. I didn't hear the first part, but Michael, maybe. And anticoagulation. So anticoagulation, uh, correct, uh, three cooks, uh, three opinions, five opinions, so it's difficult. Yeah. So uh, we refer to the uh, international guidelines for conservative treatment. So um, at least uh, 12 months, usually in an unprovoked DVT, iliofemoral DVT. Um, um, I'm very open to extend this, um, maybe then later on on the lower dose, half dose. I'm more a fan of a prolonged anticoagulation. This is my own um, opinion, my personal opinion. I'm not adding any uh, antiplatelet therapy. By, the, uh, by that time, you do not have data. There's a study going on called Arriva trial from Nils Kucher, um, which uh, analyzes if an additional antiplatelet therapy with aspirin helps to uh, improve patency. So from that standpoint, I think it's clear. Um, in terms of stockings, um, I rely on our um, national guidelines. They recommend compression. I know the recent chest guidelines, they do not recommend stockings. I'm a little bit um, afraid, actually, of this uh, um, um, yeah, guideline. So we have two complete opposite guidelines, um, uh, national, international. So this is a difficult point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Rick, what do you think? No, not, what's your practice yeah, now? Yeah, not really much to add. The, the, the thing is that, you know, I agree with Michael on the, on the anticoagulation. I'm a little bit, I don't know, maybe more pragmatic than, than, uh, than following guidelines. Um, so the anticoagulation, as I said, uh, you know, anticoagulation, I do use antiplate. This has something to do with, with the backup that I feel that I have if something goes, uh, goes wrong. Uh, you know, if you have a reocclusion and and uh, I need some some surgical uh, speci um, specifically uh, venous surgeons, so I'm a little bit I'm a little bit more I'm a little bit more aggressive uh, in that in that way. And compression stockings um, is something that you know I just tell the patient you know if you if you feel good good about it then 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 do it. Uh, and um, and I you know. I don't not really recommend it. I don't see that it's going to have a benefit for for the for the result for the really patency um, results. So, yeah, I don't, and I also don't see don't, don't see evidence of that. So, in terms of patency, I fully agree. It's more for symptomatic treatment for doing the patient yeah. on pain relief. Yeah, that is. Yeah. My opinion, so. Yeah, I do, I do send them to a psychologist though. <laughs> No, no, yeah, that, that, that's what I say. You know, that's why I say, you know, if you feel good about it, do it. And, you know, if it's 30 degrees out there and, and, and yeah, I'm, you know, it's so, such a hustle to, to, to have those compression stockings and please leave them, leave them away. I mean, I'm not going to tell you that you're going to have to wear them all the way until you, you know, right? So. Well, 30 degrees is good. It's 40, 50 degrees here. So <laughs> no, but you, have a, you have a lower humidity. That's very important. Humidity rules. <laughs> Well, that's just in Riyadh. The rest of the East and West Coast are very humid. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, we don't have any more questions from the audience. Uh, I have just one uh, comment or question, since I guess the topic of the hour is still, of course, COVID. Uh, what has it changed your practice, number one, in terms of seeing different patients? And the second part is, has the disease in terms of pathology and results and response to treatment different than if you've seen patients that are COVID or the same? I don't see a difference. Uh, I don't see it. I didn't treat any COVID patients uh, with the thrombosis. Um, and I've got a couple of questions from different patients that are treated over the time. Um, should I should I take the, the uh, vaccination? Should I not because I have a stent or I, I had a thrombosis or stuff stuff like that? I you know, of course, I'm not in the in the university anymore. I don't get everything. You know, I don't hear anything uh, or everything. But um, I don't see a clear proof that that it relates to to one another. I mean, you guys 
know way much more than I uh, at that point probably currently. So what is your what's your take on that, Michael or Mianna? Yeah, so I fully agree. Um, keep, also, we did not treat any significant DVT. I can remember two cases with pulmonary embolism uh, where we just treated for life saving um, the severe DV, uh, the severe pulmonary embolism, but both patients died um, um, unfortunately because of sepsis. Um, in terms of vaccination, my standpoint is absolutely clear. Go for vaccination, regardless you have a venous stand or not, go for vaccination. Yeah. Okay, excellent. So yeah, we, we haven't seen that much in terms of uh, DVT or PE and COVID that much, I guess, compared to uh, normal practice. Uh, thankfully, COVID here hasn't really hit that hard. Things, things were very well controlled, thankfully. So anybody else have any comments or any questions, uh, any last minute questions from the audience? We're happy to take it in the last couple of minutes. Otherwise, we're going to wish everybody uh, a good night. So anybody else, Michael, Rick, Abdelaziz, Mohammed? You know, perhaps uh, not all DVTs are the same. Uh, and that's probably why it's extremely difficult in the literature to find out uh, a unified protocol, uh, you know, wherever you go, whatever conference you go, whatever you read, you, you're really gonna have uh, to find a lot of variations. Uh, yeah. Perhaps, you know, uh, uh, somebody with a short segment alifemoral uh, stenosis with a stent is somebody that you do not need to put on a lifelong or for ten, one year anticoagulation, probably three months, a maximum of six or any integration is going to work. Uh, but uh, versus somebody with extensive DVT where you have done extensive work over several hours, that's somebody who's going to take a, a, a lot more aggressive anticoagulation therapy. So I think it's going to be uh, custom made according to the volume of thrombus, uh, the amount of work you have done, the comorbidities. Uh, so I think uh, the help of uh, uh, of our colleagues in hematology is very important, but I generally go more aggressive the more the aggressive the disease is. Okay, yeah. Okay, wonderful. Uh, Rick, you were gonna say something? Uh, no, I just wanna, uh, I, I, wanna, I wanna end it from my side. I, I just wanna thank you very much for the, an excellent, uh, excellent uh, meeting and, and a very in-depth uh, discussion. So I think that was, that was really, really good one of the best discussions uh, sessions that, that I had. So congratulations um, on, on, uh, on, on um, making this possible. And um, yes, um, um, nice to see you also again um, and hopefully live some, some uh, soon again. Absolutely. Hopefully it was really a pleasure to have you uh, as well as uh, Michael and hopefully we'll see you guys soon uh, uh, live and maybe have dinner together or something and best. You yes. never know. And maybe, of course, even more importantly, if we, we can do some collaboration between uh, Saudi society as well as your different centers, that would be also amazing as well. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Okay, perfect. Thank you, everybody, very much. Uh, have, have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. You too. Thanks a lot. Bye.